Hey everybody, welcome to Office Hours with the Professor, the show that's proudly irrelevant. So today we're going to start a new series, which given my rate of putting out videos will probably be the focus of the next several eternities. Now, originally for this video, I had planned to actually remake my Evenki video, but unfortunately I don't have my notes on that language here in Warsaw. So instead, we're going to take a look at late European prehistory, covering the period between 8,000 and 1,000 years ago. Now, this is a time that I like to call the Age of Barbarians. Now, earlier this month, I visited the mecklenburg vorpommern region of Germany, and I was very privileged to explore the Tollensetal battlefield, Tollensetal, excuse me, battlefield, where a bunch of Bronze Age badass bros got together some 3,300 years ago and fought to the death in an all-out boss championship battle royale. Now, what they were fighting over, we may never know, other than that some of them felt like crossing a bridge while others strenuous. observable today in the form of disarticulated bones and weapons dredged up from the river and the several surviving tombs dotting the landscape. Archaeologists think that at least 3,000 men took part in this battle, a huge number by prehistoric standards. years later, here I am crossing a much nicer modern bridge in the same area without so much as a peep from the guys weed whacking nearby, casually doing what thousands of prehistoric badasses fought and died to do. And here I am laying down in some poor schlub's final resting place. To this day, there are several stone tomb chambers in the woods nearby, and it's very possible that the original inhabitant of this tomb died in the battle here and was honored with a relatively fancy tomb for his mighty deeds. Now, the legacy of late prehistory is woven intimately into the landscapes, languages, and folklores of Europe to this day. From Shetland to Malta, from the Urals to Portugal, the silent specters of distant days have always haunted the European consciousness. Since the Neolithic itself, Europeans have gazed with wonder upon the burial mounds and standing stones of other years, and farmers have turned up with their plows the weapons and bones of mighty heroes fallen and forgotten, left long behind by the rolling tide of ages. For the last 8,000 years, Europeans have inhabited a landscape filled with subtle reminders of mysterious and long-gone peoples utterly alien to themselves. So, this is a video series covering a period of about 7,000 years 
from 6,000 years before the Christian era to 1,000 years into it. Now, given that Christianity is irrelevant for most of this series, I will attempt to follow the years ago format in my dating, as opposed to before the Christian era, Christian era dating commonly used when discussing written history. Now, as I say, this series is going to focus on the cultures of the European Neolithic through to the Iron Age. And I'm going to call this whole period the Age of Barbarians, in keeping with my convention of using pop culture fun nomenclature to talk about real prehistory. And I've previously used the word cavemen to talk about Paleolithic populations in my last series, because cavemen are awesome, and framing the discussion in those terms makes it a lot more fun. Likewise, I'll use the term barbarians to refer to Europeans of late prehistory. Now, as with cavemen, I'm stripping the word of any negative connotation whatsoever. While this term in popular parlance excuse me, connotes unsophistication and brutishness, I use barbarian as a complementary term of endearment and admiration. For the purpose of this series, let's have the word barbarian connote resiliency, heroic deeds, and a rich, orally transmitted intellectual and folkloric tradition. We'll have it denote small-scale food producers of late European prehistory. You'll also hear me refer to Europeans of this time as those dudes, something I've done mentally for years now, in acknowledgement to the fact that we really don't know what they called themselves or what languages they spoke, many of them anyway, which were diverse in spite of many shared cultural elements. Now, the Neolithic through the Iron Age is, of course, a very long time, and although the peoples inhabiting Europe at this time formed many distinct populations in terms of culture, language, and genetics, I cannot help but be struck by the level of cultural continuity that existed throughout the period. <laughs> The setting sunlight glows soft as you sling your plow over your shoulders, leading the cows back to their enclosure. Mist gathers along the distant trees, and an evening chill is in the air. Returning home for the day, you pass the barrow, ringed by mossy standing stones that lifts its green head a short distance from your village. <laughs> Mighty king rests beneath this monument, or what primordial magic is sealed within, has been long lost to the ages. Your people may tell stories about an ancient battle fought here, its heroes sleeping with their treasures in the narrow halls of death. Or it may be that some sorcerer, fairy, or troll raised his dwelling here from the living earth. Whatever the case, it is clear to your people that the fertile lands you call home have been inhabited for a long, long time, whether by spirits or men. Tales of the ancients live on among your people in your oral history, for writing is an art yet unknown. Returning to the village, you cross the protective ditch and palisade to a ring of dwellings. Now, depending on the era, you may live with your extended family in one of Europe's longest enduring cultural traditions, the communal longhouse, which remained a fixture of life from the earliest Neolithic clear through to the medieval period, and is the architectural ancestor of the mythical Herat and Valhalla.
a typical village contains two to five longhouses or six to ten single family huts. Now, entering the village, you hear the otherworldly whistle of a flute. And let's imagine that it's being played by a guy hopping around on one foot who looks exactly like Ian Anderson. Now, after dropping your grain off at the miller, depending on the season, you walk into your family home, and the aroma of cooking meats fills your nostrils. You help yourself to a ceramic beaker of barley beer, perhaps a horn of mead, and join your friends and family around the fire. They, like you, are dressed in pants, shirts, and cloaks of leather, rough-spun wool. And above you, suspended on a string from the rafter, hangs a thunderstone or an ancient stone axe head turned up or even more ancient stone axe head turned up by your plow in the fields. And these are occasionally found by your people and they're thought to have been cast down by the thunder god in his rages. Some believe that it was in fact the work of the elves while others see them as the ancient weapons of mortal warriors. At any rate, to hang it up in your home is a protection from lightning, fire, and the mischief of the elves. <laughs> Now, this scene that I have just described is a mundane one, depicting typical people living typical lives. But this story, this setting is remarkable in that it could just as easily describe life in the 6th millennium before Christ as it could life in the 1st millennium after. Consider also the pictures provided which could reasonably depict life at any point over a period of thousands of years. Certainly, the details change over this period, notably in the introduction of metal tools, the religion practiced by the people, and the languages spoken. But if we consider these elements to be window dressing to the basic surrounding cycles and institutions of daily life, it is truly astonishing how little ch things change over a period of more than 6,000 years. From the 6th millennium BC, from Poland to Britain, you're basically living in a Jethro Tull song. Let's check over the same region in the 1st millennium after Christ, and you're still living in a Jethro Tull song. <laughs> No, no, not Aqualung Tull, you understand, but Songs from the Wood Tull. May I make my fond excuses? And I'm not just making this series as an excuse to plug his new album, although that certainly helps. The album does, in fact, slam, I might add. It's an amazing album. And what's really cool about it is that his new album takes its cover art inspired by the rock art of the Nordic Bronze Age, which we will talk about here. Pretty cool stuff. And here it is, the album itself, hard copy on compact disc. No 8-tracks for me. You can see this cool rock art style. And as long as I'm on this particular tangent, this is a pretty big month for 70s British prog rock. Yes, just dropped their new album this very day, which I excitedly went out and got. It slams in like manner. 
highly germane to the discussion is this cool little barbarian caveman dude, I can't decide which one he is, looking up into the starry night sky on the album cover. As a matter of fact, these boys are doing a concert in Warsaw on Tuesday, and I'm going to see them, or what's left of them. Something tells me that in the next few videos, we'll be listening to a lot of Jethro Tull, Yes, and Asia. Who, you ask, why Asia? Because the current iteration of Yes contains not one, not two, but three Asians. Half of original Asia and three quarters of current Asia are also members of current Yes. So it's become less Yes and more Sure, how about? Chinese doesn't really have a technical word for Yes. But anyway, it's basically Asia calling themselves Yes, playing Yes music. Pretty awesome. Anyway, suppose we took a guy from the Central European linear pottery culture of 7,000 years ago, and then we took a Scottish Pict of 1,500 years ago, and had them trade places like Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. Each of them would experience pretty severe culture shock, and they would have to learn languages completely unrelated to their own. The presence or absence of technology, like the wheel, the sail, and domesticated horses, would be a pretty big deal too. The linear pottery guy would have to get used to a hierarchical pantheon of Indo-European gods and goddesses while the Pict would have to get used to a much more diffuse, animistic, and shamanistic religious tradition. However, each would find a comfortable familiarity in a surprising number of institutions that have remained more or less unchanged from one to the other. The communal hall or longhouse, the burial mounds and megaliths, the small-scale farming and herding economy, and the endemic tribal warfare, including headhunting practices, are all elements held in common. Certain beliefs may have even crossed that gulf of time, including, but not limited to, a parallel world of elves and fairies, a psychedelic drug cult, and a belief that swamps and islands as the meeting points of land and water constituted special places where the natural and supernatural met. Once each of our time travelers has settled in, learned the language, and decapitated a few rival tribesmen, I think they would be pleasantly surprised by how at home they felt. the legacy of late prehistory, which hangs heavy on the European consciousness, I don't think it's any surprise that high fantasy is primarily a genre of Western literature. For thousands of years, Europe effectively was a fantasy world, complete with elves, trolls, and wizards in pointy hats. And yes, we'll talk about the pointy hats. There's, there's a reason behind it. Anyway, that were very real to its inhabitants, although your mileage may vary today. In the same way that fantasy worlds will go millennia without advancing past the Middle Ages, Europeans spent thousands of years headhunting and raising monoliths in what must have seemed like a static or at least highly cyclical, cyclical universe. To be sure, there were differences between groups and times, in culture, worldview, and language, but even this must have highlighted the mystery of the past and reminded Europeans that they, too, would someday be known only by their silent monuments. Living in a landscape of monuments raised by unknown hands and walking on a ground that occasionally turns up mysterious axe heads 
leads the imagination to run wild, especially when one meditates on the understanding, however nebulous, that these people who raised the monuments and left the axe heads were not your own. It is thus entirely unsurprising that Europeans would imagine a past age of magic and heroism for this time, especially given the absence of written records. As some of my viewers know, I am a massive Lord of the Rings fan, and it's easy to imagine how Tolkien could look at the weapons and monuments of prehistoric Britain and allow his imagination to conjure up kingdoms, heroes, and races now lost to time, just as Europeans have done since those very days. In a sense, Middle-earth was a real chapter in the story of Europe. Reading Tolkien's work, especially that chapter that got left out of the movie, unfortunately, about the Barrow Downs, where they got stuck in the burial mound and Tom Bombadil had to come and rescue them, really ignited my interest in this area of prehistory. Now, in the age of modern archaeology, anthropology, linguistics, and folkloristics, we are gaining a greater understanding of this long-lost, late prehistoric European world, and its secrets are becoming known to us once more. By the way, along with Lord of the Rings, a somewhat guiltier pleasure of mine is Conan the Barbarian. Not altogether guilty, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I believe that Robert E. Howard would be thrilled to hear that the world of his imagination was indeed not that far off from reality. Conan would have felt right at home in most of the real-world Hyborian age. This is, after all, a time when tribes and kingdoms rise and fall, a time of bloody battles and wise wizards, and a time when nubile priestesses seek out hunky partners for their fertility rituals. And that's right up Conan's alley. Well, anyway, our next video will talk about the conditions and players in the Europe of 8,000 years ago, and the generations of struggle between the hunters and the farmers, the shamans and the priests, the last of the cavemen and the first of the barbarians, or if you like, the caveman to barbarian pipeline. I just realized now, as I'm editing this video, that right after I said I would avoid using the Christian era dating, I fall right into that trap. Well, it's hard to avoid. Bite me.